tuning in to your day off podcast, hosted by your boys, Corey and Tony. I think by the end of today, I might have another best friend. They're committed to making you fall in love with the hair industry, one podcast at a time. Uh, you're going to grab a lot of information. Yeah, you're going to learn a lot. Presented by Hair Industry. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. Your day off podcast will begin after a word from our sponsors. to sit with my best friend tony and we have a surprise guest today with uh with miss katie may what's up tony what's up brother how you doing good man how you doing katie i'm good i'm excited i'm excited that you're here man I'm we, don't, too. we don't get to do like uh you know uh without it being a special event i don't get to grace I mean, you with my event presence because of our guest but we need you know, to do this more often we do i kind of <laughs> like i, I kind of mm-hmm. like having a girl's perspective mm-hmm you know, and apparently she, uh, she, uh, you know, makes the place look a lot better. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> we have witnesses for that. <laughs> we have judgment from that. <laughs> um, dude, I am so excited about t- Why do we always say that? I hate when I say we're so excited, but it's true. We're so excited about, uh, about the podcast today. It's actually not only one of our favorite podcast but it's also we get a lot of response to uh to the podcast um today we have on mr gordon miller and uh it's the what we like to uh, build the state of the industry uh, a podcast um it was inspired by the state of the union which you uh um, when the president speaks in front of congress um in january and, and i thought how interesting it would be um to to talk about the state of the industry and i thought nobody was more presidential than our guest today Oh, without a doubt. He, uh, <laughs> Wait, which president are we talking? <laughs> <laughs> don't don't answer that. No, well, we're not. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, yeah, it, it really is. I mean, it's like having, uh, you know, at, like having family on, right? I mean, yeah. he literally, uh, he is uh, a mentor <laughs> for us. He's a. Uh, he's just yeah. I mean he. He's a friend. He's a true, true. Yeah, he is like family with, with a lot of knowledge. Because uh, all year long, I, uh, I I'll text Gordon if I have a question, whether it's a number or whether his opinion about where the industry is. Um, you know, just about whatever pops up on social or pops up in the news or something. So we have lots and lots of conversations. But at least once a year, we get to sit down and and, and chat about them. Um, last year surprising even surprised himself a little bit he was a little optimistic about the industry and then and 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 you know uh gordon's not really the one that sees the world through optimistic eyes so uh so uh i, I kind of have we have a few questions about from last year that that we'll get into and then we'll and then we'll get into uh into this year and uh anyways should we get in yeah let's do it gordon welcome back to the state of the industry what in 2024 right or 2020 i don't know whatever it is we'll talk about 2023 and then We'll get into into yeah for sure it is great to be back it is great to be back. I, I i do have to say like a list of comments you know is in my head I, I know you guys are open and not, the guests are supposed to say quiet you know so so first of all i'm thrilled that kate is here um i feel a little less attractive than i normally feel here when she's not here because <laughs> next to you guys i i come off pretty good as soon as you throw katie into the mix there's a little <laughs> bit of a problem so um so that disappoints me in spite of my adoration you know for for having katie here and i assume that she'll be a little bit of the peanut gallery so kind of like a, a few years back that one of those state of the union things that you mentioned um i remember somebody in the audience going liar <laughs> 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 and so that'll be katie's job today yeah, well, yeah, we, we have notes from last year so she'll she'll call you out where, where, where yeah, you there you go yeah and remember, we... those were predictions i i'm I don't, I don't, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. I, I'm very curious. I should have gone back and listened. Yeah. And also we brought her in so you can feel the way we feel all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Take that so many ways. I balance everyone out. Okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. More, in more a good way. Can, in a good way. More than you know. So, I mean, just as a broad, like to open up the conversation, how did last year go in the industry? Do you think it was a positive year? Do you think, you know, where are we? I mean, nobody, nobody really has the numbers yet. So it's so fascinating. Um, big picture, the corporations seem to do really well. At least that's what I'm hearing, you know, through third quarter, you know, the fourth quarter stuff isn't really out yet. Um, so, but it looks like, you know, brands did well. It looks like the big distributors did well. I'm not 
quite as confident in getting reports yet from the independents, but corporate side seemed to do really well. And that usually means that the industry generally should have done well. The chatter is interesting. Um, most of the people I talk to and know pretty well, you know, um, had, had a great year, you know, but then the online social chatter is very much the opposite. I feel like, oh, this was one of the more challenging years ever. We really killed it in 2022. A lot of people fell back. So I, I feel like there's kind of two big realities, you know, maybe three, you know, um, the third being just kind of like business as usual or business as um, just a lot of industries still has no clue how businesses from year to year, day to day, even actually just aren't paying attention enough. I mean, I think that's the nature of small business. But then again, vocally, and not just vocally, just, you know, talking with the more experienced, the more successful with a little or a lot of experience, just killing it. And the killing it seems to be mostly from just doing what we've always done, known has worked. And then you've got a whole lot of others who seem to be struggling a little bit. And I think, and some are struggling a lot. And I, I do believe a lot of it is isn't uh, is just kind of a correction from 2022. All that success that was talked about, I think a lot of it was um, price increases that maybe were too much. Just a lot of stuff. There's been a lot of blowback this year. So I, I think it's a little bit all over the board. We're not going to know much until, you know, final numbers come in at the corporate level and we start to get a better sense of salons too. So time will tell. I know that like um, when I was at ABS last year, you and I on Monday were having a conversation in the middle of the floor and it kind of felt like a Saturday. Like, like it seems like the shows are, I don't know if they're ever going to be like pre pandemic wise, but no, they I don't think so. Seem, but last year there was a huge uptick in all the shows that we went to as far as attendance mm -hmm. goes, as far as uh, classes go. Um, and just relative so to 2020 relative to the year before, which was a, a somewhat of a disaster. Right, but even relative to a couple years before, it just kind of felt. It, let me let me back up. Even if it's not, uh, even if it's not as mount, the the people, the energy was there. Like it was high energy. Mm -hmm. uh, agreed. There, um, it, it seems like, agreed. and this is just Layman. You you certainly would know the numbers better, but it seemed like there was a huge uptick at the shows, oh. like extension work and and people teaching extensions and and the extension yeah. classes were crazy. Is that? Is is that still viable, and is it a strong yeah. is it a strong point in our our industry? Yeah, I mean everything you see in here, and, and the extension could have been a ton of money, you know, poured into the extension business acquisitions and all kinds of stuff. So it, it feels like it finally has arrived, and it's not going anywhere. And um, you know, um, again, there's there's no data around it other than you know going on the show floors. I mean, clearly the extension the extension companies have taken pretty serious real estate. And so, so I think, yeah, and the sophistication, you know, of the companies has grown and the models has grown and the quality of everything is up there. So I, I would say absolutely. It's very niche still. Um, I've not seen any numbers, like how many salons offer extensions and how deep people go, but uh, it's, it's here and it's here to stay. Mm, that, so it's not Vivids, huh? <laughs> well, I mean, Vivids, Vivids are still around. So my, in Trader Joe's, you know, two of the, my checkout people always have their vivids, um, but they both do them at home. You know, vivids, yeah, vivids, vivids is vivids. Oh, yeah. nothing? Okay. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought, <laughs> is that one else supposed to say liar? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, vivids is a category. I mean, all you have to do is look at Pulp Riot, I think, to have a sense of, you know, it, it feels like it's, it's very much flattened out. You know, it's not what it once was. And um, I think you know, Vivis has always been more inside the industry. I, I've always looked at the math of Vivis and said, how, what percentage of all dollars being spent in the Vivid hair color category when it comes to product, the product itself, is ending up on hairdressers' heads versus clients' heads? No one's been able to answer that for me. I have a feeling the numbers would be shocking. Um, it is what it is. It is like a slow play. Like, it's very cool and had this huge, like, boom. But, and it's becoming still more and more it like leaking into the corporate world and things like that, especially with people working from home and, you know, having a lot more flexibility with their jobs. It's becoming slowly a more norm kind of across the board. But I think it's like an ebb and flow with vivids, vivids, like when a new company comes out, you know, with a whole line, like when, I know when pulp hit, it was like, holy crap, like these are awesome colors and new right. so kind of had a boom. So whenever there's a brand that kind of elevates it, 
it gets really hot, especially with hairdressers and more artistic groups. And then yeah. kind of like fashion, it will slowly leaks out to everybody else. I, I kind of think it's yeah. like uh, it was such a it, it, it showed so well on social. So when when social first came True. out and we were trying to and we were looking for attention, I think that that a lot of attention True. went around Vivid's. Um, but but uh, to Gordon's point earlier that people are doing it at home. Right. Because still the expense of it is 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 it's way expensive to do Um, the upkeep right. is incredible um, for it. And by the way, it lasts like a week. You know, I can't tell you how uncomfortable those conversations as an operator is. It's like, yeah, this is awesome. This is beautiful. It's going to cost you like two mortgages and it's going to last for a week. You know, so like th that's a hard sell. That's a hard sell for us. You know, I, I think that I think yeah. that at home market um, is probably a stronger market for the company. And I don't know if that's their play or not. You know what I mean? But. But I think it's a yeah, I, don't, I don't know. But I've talked a lot to consumers, just people I run into all over the place. I'm always curious for years now, you know, I've been asking people where they get their hair, their vivids done. I've yet to meet a consumer who's had one done in the salon, which is weird, you know, thinking about it. But I've easily talked to well, probably well over 100 people, you know, just everywhere, planes, planes, trains, automobiles, you know, just <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's fascinating. Well, you, you've you've talked to lots of people that have had them done in the salons. They just happen to be working in a salon. Yeah, that's true too. <laughs> <laughs> that's true too. That's true too. So, but you know, interestingly, let, let me add this. I, and I said this the other day in front of a crowd. You know, um, we're kind of in an era of of incrementalism. You know, meaning that you know we're a fairly mature industry, and so much of success is in the. Um, is, is, is just in the margins of everything. You know, growing a business at a certain point is about, you know, how do you add a little bit here, a little bit there? How do you, how do you, how do you take your Vivids category if that's the service you offer and add a little bit there? How do you get, how do you bring in extensions and pick up a little bit there? How do you cut your expenses a little bit? This kind of incremental growth, um, which is kind of a common thought process around mature businesses. I, I think we need to be thinking that way, way more about our industry. Mm, that's good. That's real good. How we talked a little bit about price. Um, where are we as far as like a price increase? I know, I know even as short ago as like 2019, 2020, you were concerned that as an industry, we were still undercharging a bit. Do you mm -hmm. think that caught up? Cause it seems like everybody's talking about price increase and everybody frankly has done price increase. Even my man, Tony mm -hmm. here, a price increase. Mm -hmm. I would hope so. Again, there's no research, you know, it just sucks that we have such bad, you know, um, access to really true information. So we base everything on what we hear. And, um, you know, big, big picture for the industry. Um, I think that's what's the biggest problem that we have, because it's the biggest problem we have as a, as a country. You know, it's like, we don't even know what the truth is anymore. It's just very good. And that's not political. It's just like about everything. You know, it's like, what's true, you know? <laughs> um, and I think it's true of our industry. So, you know, if you go based on the conversations, it feels like everybody has, but I, I know that's not true um, because we have a big chunk of the industry that doesn't really participate in all this stuff. And I know when I look at my neighborhood salon, some of the smaller ones that just, you know, aren't really happening. They're just like little, little tiny mom and pops that are on the low end of the price point. They don't seem to have made many changes. So, but, but those who we pay more attention to, you know, who, who are, you know, probably in the 50, probably half the industry, I would assume they have. Um, and again, I'm hearing an awful lot who are kind of reconsidering or or not reconsidering. They raise their prices and now they're just going, oh, my gosh, you know, I had a terrible year. And it's like, you know, people aren't coming. And what's happened to people? Not what's happened maybe to what I'm doing um, in my business that's impacting how people think about me. Because one of the challenges is we don't usually know why we lose clients. They just don't come back. So there's a lot of that. So I feel like, yes, we've probably increased prices. Those who are kind of seriously in the game. I think there's a portion who have overcorrected because they got bad advice. We had a blowing up of coaches, you know, that came post pandemic that I think had an impact on a lot of salons. Again, we don't know the math. We don't know. When I look at all the coaches and just start multiplying how many people they could be working with, and some of them make up crap about that and you hear some coaches we you know we go thousand salons and then you go look at their salon locator and they got 50 people you know so it's like what so you know how many people are really being directly influenced by coaches through that and i think there's been some issues there over over um over correcting for past mistakes and not and then i think you have those who are just listening who are making decisions on their own 
everybody's saying raise your prices, we're raising ours. And we just don't have a good sense of success or failure, you know. And there's a lot of salons that jumped on the price increase bandwagon, might have done it right, but don't have the communication capabilities to effectively sell a client on a price increase, which is its own problem. You know, we got to communicate with our people, especially if we're making up for years of not increasing our prices. And that in itself is another problem. You have too many salons who haven't raised prices in 10 years decided to make up for all 10 years in one increase. That is strategically a nightmare. And when we blame our clients for that, like you effed up your business, you didn't raise your prices. That's on you. Now, if you're going to correct your prices, you got to be a business person and figure out how do we get there, you know, and not throw myself under the bus in the process. And I've seen salons throwing themselves under the bus. Well, and then you look and we talked about this earlier on social, you like one post of someone talking about raising your prices and then you get 40 other posts about raising your prices and how your business. So it's kind of like a good point, you know, that affects people too. I think what well, certainly does. Uh, but, but you know, on that though, Gordon, I mean, it, this is twofold. This is both like pointing the finger and trying to absorb the information a little bit is that I don't know how, if you haven't raised your prices and you do a color service, how you can stay afloat. You know, it seems like it seems like our color's gone up from like seven or eight dollars a tube to almost twelve dollars a tube now. You know, so you know it's almost. Gone but up you're talking five, you're talking five dollars. I mean, so seriously, so let's say it's a hundred. Okay. How, how much is that? Call? Let's walk through the math. I think it's a okay. fascinating exercise. So uh, I'm the client. I come in. I've got beautiful long wavy hair. I love it. Sure, <laughs> kind yeah. of like what I had in 1974. I had it kind of really, kind of a nice thing going on. You have pictures. It didn't happen. I, I did have. I do have pictures. I had hair down, down halfway down my shoulder. Um, I, I had some hair back in the day. Um, so anyway, so I got all this hair, and I'm coming in for cover service. And so, tell me what it is, and the, the fast version of how much you're going to charge me for the service, and how much is your cost of product. Oh, you're, you haven't made an increase, you, but today you're that example you just gave me. How much are you going to charge me for the service, and what's your what's your cost of color product? I mean, let's say I don't know. Let's say a hundred bucks to make it easier. Okay. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and your color cost was seven, and now it's twelve. Right. Right. Yeah. Yes. You're two. Okay, so went up five bucks. So you got to raise me to stay even. I'm not talking about getting ahead, but worst case, worst case, you just want to stay even. You don't want to be worse off than you were before. So you got to raise your color service price to the client, everything included, from 100 to 105, and you're even. Yeah, 5%. And you're even. 5%. That's nothing. Like, like if you're any good, a client's going to go, okay, whatever. I mean, if you can communicate even a little bit, you, that should not. So yes, I agree with you completely. And anybody who's nervous about going from 100 to 105, I'm like, you know, you a need to sort out the communication aspect of this because this this should not be for anybody a difficult sale, especially <laughs> if you haven't raised your prices forever, and <laughs> you can have a rational conversation. Absolutely, and 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 that five dollars. I mean, are they willing to take a risk with another hairdresser or, you know what I mean? Because that, that right. turned out great or it could be a nightmare. Yeah, I mean, so that's- And you have an explanation. Funny. All I'm doing is passing on my cost increase. I'm not even marking it up, you know? If it was me and I was nervous, I'd probably take out my salon center or cosmoprof bill and be like, mm -hmm. I just want you to actually see. I'm not, all I'm doing is passing on the cost. A lot of businesses are marking up. I don't know if you go to the restaurants, you know, but- you know, they're, they, you know, they're doubling down. So you know, most businesses, you know, whatever your increases are, yeah, you usually mark up your markup, you know, because, you know, you, you need to in, in a certain way. Um, and if you're keeping up with price increases, doing it annually, this is not a big deal. And this is what I heard from so many, even coming through pandemic. It's kind of like we were good before the craziness economically started to the inflation. And, and I would argue still that um, as bad as we've had, we've had, we've, Back to what Katie said about social, there's been so much, God help you if you click on an inflation, anything, you know, and then you start to see it and see it and see it. And there's a lot of confusion. You know, some people are like, you know, inflation is 50%, you know, and inflation at the salon level is not the same as at the grocery store. And so, so, you know, you have to get real about inflation too. And 
the overall inflation for salons, once you push past single items like color, and that's a, that's a big deal for salons. Colors are a big thing. But if you put it in the context of all of your costs, our inflation is not like 20%. I mean, it's not, you know, unless your rents went through the roof, which most, most rents were going a little bit in the other direction, you know, um, it depends where you're at, but, but you have to look at your entire business model. You can't just look at color. Yeah. I mean, rent goes up 3% usually, uh, annually. Depending on the kind of lease you have, you know? Yeah. Um, so, and, you know, I, I think it, for, for me, when Corey and I, we talked about, you know, 10% was the perfect, uh, raise for us in order to keep up with inflation, keep up with product mm -hmm. costs, keep up with absolutely able to maintain what you made the year before. Yeah, for and sure. And did you lose a lot of clients, either of you, through that 10%? Zero. No, zero. Because zero. I've been doing these clients since the dawn of time. But, that, but, but you know, and you make it good. Yay. Yeah. We're definitely in a different, you know, we're, well, but, and by the way, <laughs> Your price increase last year went up like 50%. Yes, so it, did. Yes, it did. <laughs> it did. Yes, it did. Because I I switched to hourly. That's why my okay. price increase went, went big, yeah. And, which is great. And if you could do that and communicate effectively with your clients, which I think that's the block that people have. That's where people get stuck, you know, because, and, and I think, you know, here's what's confusing about hourly. And, and Katie, you probably, you know, have an answer. You know, because the, the raise of 50% doesn't always translate into 50% of that your revenue goes up 50% necessarily. It just depends on how you do what you do and how hourly translates into the effect across your entire business. And if you got 50% increase in your revenue at the top line, good for you. And if you did it um, without losing anybody, you need to go on the road and tell other people how to do it. Because there's a lot of people who did go hourly who lost a lot of business because they didn't know how to my, communicate what they were doing. My clients love it. And I mean, essentially what I did was took my average service ticket and then mm -hmm. upped it to like the closest 25. So, um, and yeah, my clients, I, everything's included. Now they're leaving mm -hmm. with their hair feeling better and looking better because I'm just doing the treatment or doing the glaze or doing what I think their hair needs. And because mm -hmm. I've already kind of calculated what it's going to cost on average, you know, with those things included for each client, it's like they're already getting it. And then if they don't get it or they don't want it for whatever reason, which, you know, <laughs> So I wouldn't know. So you're doing the but, sales pitch once when you do hourly, not not every appointment. Yeah, that's interesting. And tips and you included got, too. Got rid of tips too, right? Yep. Yeah, that's interesting. And that's they love it, and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and again, if you're doing it in a way that that you can communicate it, you know, then it's great because I I don't think most of this is a block. We are not an industry that is very good at communication. We know that big picture. And, um, and that's probably the biggest reason we see so many people who struggle because they can't, they don't want to do price increases because they don't want to talk about it. You know, they don't want to make other changes because they don't want to talk about it because they don't know how to talk about it and, or they're fear-based, you know? And so it's, it, it's interesting, you know, but I love it. Good for you. Fantastic. Well, as far as communication and I hope it's okay for me to pivot. Pivot. Yeah. Yeah. How, I think with the communication, because yes, we're artists and, you know, typically terrible at communication, but um, how do you think AI this year has affected our communication in the salon? Not, not much, you know, because I don't think the majority of people use it or have used it yet. So of those who are using it, you know, um, I'm finding, you know, yeah, some people are using it in social, you know, some people are using it, you know, playing around with it, trying to get used to um, some are using it for the geeky, like the really, you know, early adopters. I think a lot of them are looking at their financial stuff with it. They're Mark. doing some design stuff with it. They're doing marketing and email stuff with it. But, you know, I, I don't think we know enough. Um, it's not that we don't even know enough. I don't think it's deep enough where we, we've got an industry shift of, of any kind yet. Um, I will say my, I was at serious business and I, um, between two classes had about 500 in it and I asked each group I was like you know wh what who's using it and it was like 70 percent had begun to use it but then in conversations afterwards it became really clear that yeah people were you know kind of putting their toe in the water which excited the heck out of me but I, I think it's early 
you know, and I, and I don't think, you know, a year from now we'll be talking about ChatGPT or any of the way we're, we're like, we're like the guys in the eighties who are building their computers in the garage. You know, that's where I feel like we are. We're like the early adopters and the old days, and most people are too young to remember, but, but that's what people did in the early days of the PC. You know, it's like, nobody thought we really would have a personal computer. Everybody thought, you know, we had the big machines and, but you had the hobbyists, you know, they were all at home doing it and they led the movement. We're kind of in that version and uh, AI is going to be inside of everything. And so, you know, we won't have to think about it. It's going to, it's already coming. It's already in Microsoft Word and Excel and it's going to come into all the booking platforms. And I don't think we'll be doing much on our own, to be honest. I, I think on the next update for Apple too, um, the Siri is going to be then IA based as well. Mm -hmm. AI, mm -hmm. AI, <laughs> AI, 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 that was, that was. It, I mean, it already is, but it's going to be enhanced. It's going to be a much deeper level of AI, you know. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Siri and Alexa are both, they've always been, you know, a form of AI, but yeah. Yeah, so it's going to be interesting, but I think it's going to have a huge impact over time, but I don't think we're there yet, you know, but I don't think it's, you know, fundamentally our biggest challenge is one-on-one -on -one verbal communication with people because that's the critical communication that gives people confidence in everything that we're doing and, and willingness to pay more or buy more or do more, you know, in the salon. So I, I don't think we'll ever escape that. You know, I think we'll hopefully we'll do a better job with marketing and more people will want to come to our salon. But then ultimately, if they're going to stay in our salon as clients, it depends on how good a job we do engaging with them one on one at the time they're sitting in the chair. Mm. What do you think about and, and it certainly I don't know. It seems like a trend, but um, but people going like deskless, salons going deskless. I, you know, there's not a whole lot new in the industry, honestly. You know, technology changes. You know that that has always happened. You know, I was alive when the calculator happened. It was a big change. Um, <laughs> so we've we've moved on from that. But believe it or not, the calculator was a big change. <laughs> so, um, and so the deskless thing has been going on for a decade, you know, easily, you know, meaning in my neighborhood, I've got like 26 salons I can walk by. Um, they pretty much all have a desk. Um, I think two have people who work behind the desk. So the desk was the thing, you know, and there was some chatter. It's like, oh, you know, the, um, the desk was a new thing that the brand shoved into the industry, which is such a weird comment. My mother is 88. I said to her, I was like, did your salon have a desk back in the 1950s, the place where people walked up? She's like, well, where were they going to put the phone if there was no desk? <laughs> <laughs> of course there was a desk. Phones have always, salons have always had a desk of some sort, or at least probably from the 1920s. Um, and so the desk has become less relevant in terms of hiring an individual person, depending on the size of the salon, which, by the way, was should have always been a decision point. And most salons in my area, they didn't get rid of the desk. They just haven't had a person standing behind it for most of them. Like the salons I'm near, I'm like none of them let anybody go during pandemic that I can think of. They, they had done that before pandemic. They just didn't need it anymore because of cell phones and because of all the other things that changed. So it's not like some earth shattering. Oh my God, everybody's getting rid of their desk. They're getting rid of some have gotten rid of the people who stood behind a desk. And now the desk is the place where the mail goes. And believe it or not, you know, mail does still get delivered and they want a place to put it. So they put it on the desk. Gordon, they, don't want, they don't want to spend the money. They don't want to spend the money to get rid of the desk. Well, I was going to say, isn't it semantics? I mean, if you said that only two of them have people, then that's like, you know, the other 24 of them essentially got rid of their desk. I mean, for what we know. Over, t over the last 10 years, everybody's acting like it's new. Like there's, there's almost nothing new to this. You know, and I just came from a conference at some of the best salons in the country, like 1,100 people, and most of them have receptionists because they're multi-million dollar salons. Sure. And yes, they're leveraging all the technology, but these are salons, some of them that are doing hundreds of thousands of dollars in retail. And so, yes, they, they've made a business case to themselves that yes, having a a person, it might be a receptionist, it might be an admin person, it might be a manager, but you know, they have a person who's probably has no responsibility doing service, who is, who is helping take care of the business in a way that, you know, needs to be done. And they would argue that that person has a relationship with the desk and may or may not, you know, you go to better salons. And again, I have two in my neighborhood that are at that, they're intercoff, one's an intercoffier salon. 
And yes, every time I walk by, the first thing I see is a desk and there's a person standing there and they're always engaging with people. Mm. So that's awesome. If they make money for you, if they make, that's the bottom line. Is it making money for you? If it's not, should it be so that you have the wrong person or the wrong process or the wrong procedure, or you're not big enough. You're not big enough. Yes. It's, you know, you're a, you're a salon doing 200 grand a year because that's just what you're doing in service dollars. It would be hard to justify a desk unless you saw value in bringing someone in that would change your business. Like by bringing this person in, our business will grow. And that's an investment we've decided to make and we'll evaluate it as we go. It, everything's been oversimplified into black and white and it's weird. And I've always talked about this. I hate that we think of our industry as one amorphous thing. Mm. It's not, you know, the luxury salon is very different than the middle of the road salon, which is very different than the value price salon, which is very different than the independent. It's like, it's like several categories of the industry probably four or five categories. The barber shop, you know, is, is a very different animal and it even has a higher end category, which is quite small and then everything else. So if you apply these ideas about change to each of the categories, I think the answer will be different and we shouldn't be so general because again, back to Katie's point, you clicked on something about have, not having a desk, you're gonna see a whole lot of stuff and you're gonna say, everybody's getting rid of their desk. <laughs> and that's just such an over, oversimplification. It's almost like, it's, like, it's, it's sort of like 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 the automobile automobile industry, right? I mean, a hundred years ago, you, you had a motor and four wheels. The cars today have a motor and four wheels. Just the body might look different. You might have new right. technology. Technology. So I th I think even with the salons, you know, you have yeah. a salon that that it, it works. That's what you, it, everything's built off. People are going to take yeah. away from, add to. They're going to yeah. try to put a spin on it, trying to make it you know different yeah. to. to attract business but at the end of the day it's still uh uh you know a people you know the people uh business i mean it's it, it you're not going to add a whole lot to it to 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 make it different other than you know technology or or just the appearance think about the phone again i mentioned a minute ago back in the 1950s when my mom was going to salons when she was a lot younger there was a phone. You called the phone and you made an appointment. We still have phones. You know, they happen to be mobile phones. You don't have many who have landlines anymore. And individuals have phones that people can contact them, depending on how the salon has set itself up to make appointments. So, yeah, we still have phones and we use them to communicate clients. We just do it in a different way, you know, and, so, and arguably it's a completely different way, but it's still a phone. We still communicate. We need to be able to communicate with our customers and potential customers when they're not in our buildings. <laughs> Well, I would argue that That's, it's not just a phone. <laughs> it's still it, it's right. more than that. Did you ever see that ad? It was like a Radio Shack it's, ad. From like it, a it, it was always, but it was always an evolution of the phone. Sure. So there was, a, so when I was a kid, I was born into a home that had a party phone. Party line phone, not a party phone. We didn't party on the phone. We had a party <laughs> line phone. So when you picked up the phone, there could be some, your neighbors could be on it. Literally, your neighbors, you had to wait your turn. That's how it worked back in the early, early days, you know, and then, and then, and then we didn't have that. But then I remember when the little beep would, would you would get, someone was calling you. That was like an evolution of the phone with the princess phone, when the phone wasn't on the wall. So the phone, yes. And now the phone is way more, the phone is a computer, blah, blah, blah. But it's still, it's still functionally. You know, the, now it's a, the way it's a we can do a party a, phone <laughs> it's a different it's a different kind of party phone big time <laughs> oh hey gordon earlier you okay so I, I don't know how to want to set this up well earlier you said that 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 the you think that the brands or you've heard that the brands have had a pretty big year or a good year mm -hmm. a good, good year, year. Mm -hmm. that's what it's saying. Mm -hmm. And then last year we were talking about the trend and you were certainly against it, but the trend of people um, uh, abandoning like retail in the salon. So mm -hmm. yeah, is, is, very much. It, certainly there's been a lot of conversation. Certainly this year we've talked a lot about it too, about people giving up retail in the salon. So, you know, uh, those, those, those two comments don't equate. Can you kind of like filter through that for me? Well, there's, there's, again, you've got these loud voices that are screaming, you know, get rid of your retail, retail's bad, blah, blah, blah. You know, what the real impact of those voices 
you know, is, you know, it's, it's interesting. Again, are, how many coaches are there? You know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, you know, I, we don't even know that, you know, so, and, and then again, how many people are they actually working with and how many people are they influencing beyond the people they work with? So there's no data that says like salons have wholesale walked away from retail. We know that, you know, 80% of salons never did much in retail. So there's, you know, there's a lot of questions as to the impact. Um, I know individually, you know, sometimes when you hear that salons have done it, and, and again, in the early parts of the conversation, uh, industry-wide conversation, you had the little videos of people going, oh, I'm grabbing all the product, I'm throwing it in the trash can, and like turn it into a meme, you know, which is just crazy stuff. But all of it's based, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, because you guys, you know, you know, are hearing everything being said, um, it seems to all be based in you should get rid of it because you can't make any money. You know, and if that if that's the theme, again, we're back to fake, crazy ass beauty news, like crazy fake news. Like it's mathematically stupid. Like anybody who says it, it's just, I'm sorry. Now that doesn't mean you need to retail. That doesn't mean you'll be good at it. You know, like I say to everybody, it's like, you don't have to do color, that's a choice. You don't have to do extensions, that's a choice. You don't have to cut hair, that's a choice. Choose what you wanna do, it's your career. And there's all kinds of options. That's the great thing about the industry. You do not have to retail. But that doesn't mean that people who do retail well don't make money. It's re it's it's idiotic. And there's this big conversation that's happening on social that feels, you know, loud. Again, we don't know how far it reaches. That just says very simply that if you buy something for 10 and sell it for 20, that you didn't make any money. And that is so mathematically backwards like ignorant like it just doesn't even make a bit of sense because i take ten dollars and i buy something whatever it is and i turn around i sell it for 20. i now have twenty dollars less the ten i spend i have a ten dollar profit then some will say yeah but then you got to go another buy another ten dollars worth of products so you didn't make any money and i'm like well well it's the first ten that you spent that you were given back and you're going to respend it by choice, by the way. The other 10 is still in your pocket. Now, there's a much more complex conversation about, well, how, what about the rest of my costs? Well, that's true of every part of your business. And that's an individual business conversation. If you can't figure out the math of how to make money on retail, then don't sell retail. But if you get somebody who understands retailing, um, they can certainly give you clarity on the math because... But I get most people don't want to retail. So there's a lot of people when someone says, you know, that, you know, I, I grew up, you know, I hated broccoli as a kid, you know, and, and I lived in a house where you ate everything on your plate. You didn't leave the table. Like, you know, I remember sitting there for like two hours waiting on the broccoli. Nothing worse than us, a little six year old eating cold broccoli, too, by the way. But if I had an aunt who came over and said, hey, broccoli's bad for you. Like broccoli is bad. You don't have to eat broccoli. Broccoli is I'd be like, can I go live with her? You know, and that doesn't mean broccoli is bad for anybody. It just means I'm hearing what I want to hear. I'm hearing that my behavior, which is probably not right, you know, is, um, because I'm just making it, you know, I was making a choice not based on what I didn't like. I just had decided I ain't doing broccoli, period. You know, so so I think that's where we're on retail. Just a lot of most of the industry isn't successful at it. Most of you just don't like it. People are like, I'm not a salesperson. Okay. And now someone says it's bad. It's just so easy to buy into the bullshit. And it is bullshit. And you know, I, I'm not saying this because I, you know, am promoting retail for brands. I you know, I don't care about any of that stuff. I have lots of people I know in the industry who live in really, really nice homes. When you talk to them, they're like, paid by retail. Paid by retail. And I'm an just... educator for Purology and most of the salons I go to because I'm tier three out of four. So I'm pretty expensive for them to pay for me outright to come in. Most mm -hmm. of them get me for free because of retail. Exactly. Most are, you know, most education in the industry that's high quality is being funded by retail. Most, um, again, I was with all these really successful, powerful salons, you know, in, in New Orleans, a serious business and so many conversations about, about this topic, because they're scratching their head going, eh, more money for us. So it's like, great, everybody drop your retail, we're killing it. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to Kerry Davis, one of my favorite coaches in the industry about it, and one of the most successful salon owners in the industry, the Gil Root Salons in San Diego. She's like, 
I pay for my education. I pay for my 401ks. You know, I pay for, you know, a profit sharing of sort type of, I don't remember all exactly the details, but she provides all of her benefits to her employees by way of retail and a lot more, you know, and, and, it, it, you know, kept her business up to date with everything, her physical facilities. I mean, she uses retail to, to really do a lot within her business to benefit everybody who works there her clients and herself as a business owner. It works. It's been proven so many times and it just bugs the crap out of me. In the statistic, it's like every time someone gets their hair done, it's like within the next 72 hours, they're going to purchase a product or something, whether it's from you or someone else. I mean, it's true. We all like a hundred percent of people in America who have, you know, two nickels buy shampoo on a regular basis. Period. Now you can say, oh, well, they buy the group, whatever. Everybody needs it. The question is, are you good enough at what you do to convince me that I need it from you? Mm. That's a bull. That's all. That's how, all. How do you think, um, how do you think the online space as far as retail goes, like Salon Interactive and, and the different, you know, third parties are coming up? It's not happening, you know, so it's not happening. I mean, it's happening, but the numbers don't make any sense. And, and look, if that makes you happy and, and, and you're able to do it, great. So here's here's the challenge. If we don't if we can't move the retail needle individually within a salon or as as a as a professional, um, for whatever reason, you, and, and, and by the way, that typically takes saying to someone out loud, this would be good for you. Mm-hmm. Some version of that. You should buy this. And here's why. Instead, and, and we fail at that somehow, if, if our alternative is, oh, he, he, here's a better way, tell people to go to a website and buy it. My argument would be most professionals who don't successfully sell retail don't remember to even mention it to the majority of clients. We think we're gonna remember to send them to a website. Right. You think you think me as a client is going to care to go to a website? Like you just you just basically said to me, you don't even care enough about the product to carry it. Like you don't. I mean, it's it's just such a disconnect. To, I think to at least to a sophisticated consumer. But there's no proof. There's there's no big chatter online about look at all the money I'm making through my affiliate. And when you dig a little deeper to the little bit of you hear about that, it's always it's, it's the coaches again. You should do this. But where's the example? Like show me. Show me the person who's killing it and, and let's hear more from that person. And I know they exist. It's not that they're not there, um, but none of the brands are talking about it in a way that's significant. Just, again, we're back to incrementalism. I, If I owned a salon, I would sell retail in person. And yes, I would have an affiliate program of sorts or some sort of online booking uh, or not booking, but purchasing option for clients. Because yeah, some people want to get it that way. Great. But to throw yourself under the bus and get rid of the what I would argue is the easy play if you, if you have your act together, which is to get people to buy retail in your salon. If you're independent, I think it's a different conversation. I think it's easier to, to not want to have that hassle, you know, because I think what a lot of independents are figuring out, it, it's not easy to run your own business, period, end of story. There's a lot to do. And so you got to figure out what do you want to do and what, what can't you do or what shouldn't you do, you know, because it's taking away from other opportunities to grow your business. Yeah, for sure. All right, this is my favorite part of the uh, of uh, of this podcast. Like, uh, w- w- looking forward, what what do you see for twenty twenty four? Um, what are the concerns? What are what are, what are, do we, are we wearing optimistic or pessimistic glasses today, uh, Gordon? And kind of walk us through that. Mostly pessimistic, you know, uh, for the year ahead. But I, I I can't really easily define that. So I'm I'm somewhat pessimistic for the world in 2024, and pessimistic for the state of American, I'll say conversations. You know, um, we're coming into a political year, and we know what happened the last time we were in a political year, and this feels like the perhaps the polit- the craziest political year of my lifetime. And I'm not taking sides; it just feels crazy, and it's going to get crazier. And all those, I think, smartest people on all sides feel we're, we've never been so divided as a country politically. But but over the last however many years, our politics have kind of bled into everything. Um, and there seems to be um, um, more and more feeling that there is no such thing as the truth. You know, um, it's talked about that way. 
And so, and I feel like that's our industry is following, following into that a little bit, you know, that we're becoming more tribal disconnected. Um, so I think, you know, that's going to be a little wonky. I think the truth is going to be less clear to people. I think clients are going to be nervous about what's happening and the economics could be impacted negatively by just the, the feeling of chaos. So I just think the world is going to be difficult in 2024 and it could have a lot of implications on the industry. When you take, when you separate it from that, you know, it feels a lot of ways like business as usual, you know, but you can't not consider the state of the larger world and how people are going to react to it. You know, when Instagram first, um, you know, got popular, um, it, it was a, it was a fun space to be, you know, um, mm -hmm. I kind of, yep. I kind of left Facebook because of, of the politics and that stuff. And like, just yep. like, me out. And, and, and sadly, um, you know, whenever you kind of open up Instagram now, it's, it's, everything is tied around some kind of slant or some kind of political or, or agree with me or your, your snot. Right. So, yep. uh, you know, uh, Instagram very much, very, very much is feeling like the old, um, you know, I guess it's the meta, the meta way. <laughs> Yeah, like, yep. like, yep. much like that. Um, and it's no longer a place where I go for joy or just to hang out. You know, um, yep. I yep. certainly go to I, I certainly go to TikTok for that. You know, just to kind of hang out. But also with TikTok, I don't engage at all. Like I am one hundred percent just just a consumer. Um, on yep. TikTok. Um, and I'm very careful about what I click on, Katie. I'm very careful about what I click on because I also know that TikTok is the quickest to fill your feed <laughs> with whatever you click on, you know, and, and you got to be careful of, about um, about what that about what that is. Um, so uh, sadly, I just think that that, you know, we're, it's the it's the meta way. And, um, yep. you know, my my Instagram engagement is by with the only by necessary right it's not it's not a place that i hang out with as a matter of fact i try to get off as quickly as i can because you start scrolling and it just gets a little sad to me you know i think it's important to say though to everybody because yes i think we are we're all feeling this and and, and i who kind of lived in these spaces for a long time become much more of an observer I, I haven't participated in facebook for probably six years really you know as a business person i have you know um but individually and professionally as an individual professional for the same reasons as you but these platforms still work so if you're marketing and you need a marketing tool i would encourage everybody to not lose the faith and to find you know just what has changed and how can you best use it because i think to not use it is, is a mistake having said that most salons most professionals have never used it well I mean, it's shocking to some people because everybody's like, oh, this is how everybody markets. It's not. I've been teaching, I've taught those classes for years and, you know, came to the realization pre-pandemic, you know, that when I go into a city and get ready to teach something, I'd start looking at salons. And I was like, I, I can't hardly find any salons in this city that are really good at, who are consistent, who put out good work, who show their salons in the proper way. So we've never collectively been good at it. I think we're worse at it than ever potentially. And so there's that too. We shouldn't be confused. And then TikTok. Um, last night I was talking to a mutual friend, Nina Kovner, my best friend in, on the planet, uh, Passion Squared, and you know mentioned something about raccoons and TikTok. Um, my my partner has he likes raccoons. I mentioned something about raccoons, and the next thing I know, she sends me a rac funny raccoon TikTok video. Mm -hmm. And then ten minutes later, she said, "It's only been ten minutes. Oh my god." my entire TikTok feed is filled with raccoons. <laughs> so, <laughs> so <clears throat> to your point. So, um, so, uh, so know no, your audience. Yeah, and, no, and note to everybody that's listening, send Gordon nothing but raccoons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody, everybody's feed will be a... Uh... Fed with uh with, with raccoons and rock. They're fun to watch. They're fun to watch. The, ra the raccoons. The raccoons are having a party on TikTok. That's it. Hey, if you can find a video of raccoons eating broccoli, oh, even eating better. <laughs> oh my god, so funny. That's the that's the best. Hey, uh, a shameless plug for a friend of ours. Um, Robbie really wants you to get on a, get you on his podcast, the Hairdresser Strong Show. So uh, I'm going to advocate for you to to be on there. And I told him that I would put you out on the podcast. I, on I, podcast. I have already said yes. I said yes when I met him for the first time in New Orleans, and maybe he's forgetting that. <clears throat> but I just said, send me a date. So I I am waiting. 
I, okay. I am waiting. I have swiped the proper way. I don't. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm I'm being ghosted. I don't. Know what to say. Right, now it's on you, Robbie. Now it's on you, Robbie. Uh, <laughs> For those for those of you that are listening, and if you have like a, a young talent, or if you have talent that's coming out of hair school, uh, the Hairdresser Strong Show, they've they've positioned themselves um, to be an advocate for rising stylists. You know, not just for the people that are coming, but um, also to also to communicate. You know, up and down. So you know, if you're a salon owner, um, he's advocating, um, or he's he's communicating. You know, what you should expect in a salon, and 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 um, B, if you're a salon owner, he's also advocating what you should look for in in in. Your young hairstyles i think it's i think it's a very unique position he's put himself in and and big shout out to him for 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 seeing it and doing it so so let me build on that shameless plug and give myself one uh, because you know i'm ceo and president of the beauty cast network as well as having a passion project called social, social beauty makers but what beauty cast is is a platform for students in school that just it's, it's almost like a media company for students because there's uh four e-blasts every uh, week that they receive, teachers get e blasts, schools get all kinds of content. I mean, it is a platform to inspire young people to get through school, go out and get their first job, and and get the right kind of first job. So, uh, that's Beautycast Network. <laughs> Love the Beautycast Network. Yes. Um, wh- 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 okay. Well, let's w- we'll end with this. I guess is where do you see? Um, like a couple years ago, there were so many. According to all the the, the rumors, there was there was there was more chairs than there were people. Where are we? Yeah. Oh, still, you know, more, well, more chair. There's more chairs than I, I'll forever argue, you know, unless something radical changes that when you really do the math of the industry that we've overbuilt, you know, we just, we just are, it, it is what it is. It's a math thing. And which is why, you know, I mentioned, you mentioned before the desk, those same salons that I walk by regularly for years. And that's kind of like my little ecosystem of the industry that I kind of project out to others because it has every kind of salon. It has suites, which by the way, we didn't get into suites, but I, I think we, this is the year for suites to do a correction. There are more suites than we can support as an industry. I'm not anti-suite in any way, but it's been overbuilt. It's a real estate industry. And we've got 26 suites, <clears throat> excuse me, 26 suite organizations in my city. Um, six, seven years ago, we had none, and they are struggling right now with getting people in, and they are struggling with retention. So you have that going on. Um, the, um, oh, I lost my train of thought where I was going back to my salons. Um, oh, the chairs. Um, for years, these salons, most of them are six, eight, ten chair salons with two, four, six people. And that's not changed. And these salons have not reduced the number of chairs because they don't want to spend the money. Same thing, like they don't want to get rid of their desk, desks. Most salons have bought, have empty chairs in them in this country. They just do. And they've been, many of them, I would say the majority of them, those chairs have been empty for years. And there's too many chairs. A lot of salons have given up trying to fill them. Some kind of go back and forth. It's just, it's just, you know, from a capacity to do work versus the actual work we're able to do and the number of clients that we serve, arguably there's too much of everything. Uh, what that means, you know, for the industry, who knows? Um, I don't think it means a whole lot um, because just because we have a bunch of physical spaces built and we have a whole lot of chairs, that doesn't mean that that number when you aggregate it is the number that's needed by the American public to take care of their hair. It just, we don't open salons because there was a hue and cry because there's people who can't get haircuts. That doesn't, that doesn't exist anywhere. Like anybody wants a haircut can get one. We open salons because someone decided they want to open a new business. We opened 26 suite buildings in a city that didn't need any more chairs. We had more than enough chairs. But they came in and that's America and that's small business and big business. And they came in and did it. And now we have more chair, even more chairs than we need. Okay. It is what it is. Do you think that there'll be a natural regression with, and I'm looking for clarity here with, um, with, mm-hmm. isn't there a bill in Congress or wasn't it passed about, about, um, about, uh, cosmetology schools and, and the prediction that we'll lose a lot of those. There was a, a um, 
there's been ever-changing regulations that schools have to meet, you know, from the Department of Education. And so they had regulations that did change. Um, Associated Press uh, did a, a report on it and said that up to 75% of schools could close. Um, nobody really but knows what's going to happen with that. Schools. Cosmo, Cosmo. Um, and the reason for Cosmo is there was a lot of changes that have taken place slowly over the years. And we're kind of an outlier as far as the way the government looks at this. Like our, our, some of our numbers, they just um, don't match what the government would like them to be. We're, you know, we have a different kind of population. A lot feel that that's unfair, but it kind of is what it is. So we don't know what's going to happen. There's a, there's a lawsuit right now um, against the Department of Education that there was a similar lawsuit um, like six years ago, and, and we won that lawsuit. We might win this one. So it's, it's hard to know. And I'm not saying, you know, that we don't necessarily, you know, need everybody who's coming through school. It's just, you know, again, it's a complicated conversation. Um, we know in every industry that you need more people to go to school than will end up working because people drop out of school. 50% of students that go to college drop out of college. You know, they drop out of cosmetology. So, you know, the pipeline to keep an industry healthy, it has to be there. It's just hard to understand sometimes what it needs to be. And, and that's forever shifting a little bit. It's complicated. Life is complicated. So is the beauty industry. <laughs> All right. So uh, before we sign off here, Gordon, give me one like optimistic thing you have for the industry this year. And this better not be silence for 20 minutes. <laughs> I, you know, I think for me, the most optimistic thing I would say is that in spite of what we said about shows, that people, you know, who are interested in, in having the best career they can and the best business they can, they're getting together. We're, we're coming back with each other. It might be a little different than it was in the past. In some ways, numbers might be smaller in certain places, you know, but I think people who are looking to be connected with other people, who want to grow their business, they're really serious about the industry. They're getting out there. They're going to things. Um, and I think that's a good thing. And I hope they'll inspire more to come out. You know, the, the movers and shaker crowd, they've always understood how important it is to get with people and they're coming back. You know, inter I was just invited to speak up in Montreal uh, in May to Interquafiore. They're expecting one of the biggest ones ever. It's the feedback they're getting. Serious business, 1,100 people. You know, that's a kick-ass event. Um, so I, I, I think yeah, those who understand the need for knowledge are out there looking for it. And I'm optimistic. I think that's a positive kind of incremental shift that we're still coming back from pandemic. Um, and I, I think that's going to be good for the entire industry. Well, I hope that the uh, the smaller shows are, are successful because uh, certainly we throw our, our smaller show. Uh, each, yeah. uh, uh, shameless plug for Presley Poe and Friends, April 13th. Absolutely. And you are growing it every year, which is a sign, right? I mean, it's, it's you know, again, it's that incrementalism that I mentioned and everything's relative. So for a, a smaller event, you know, to, for, hey, as long as you're growing, it's good. As long as you're growing, it's good. I like that. We can go out on that note. Mr. Gordon Miller, once again, thank you so much for your your time. Thank you for your knowledge. And and thanks for the, uh, the, the, the state of the industry 2024 or 2020 past. I don't know, whatever. Uh, moving forward. Gordon, uh, thanks for hanging out with us. And thank you for joining us on your day off. Try safe. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, share it with friends, give us a rating and drop a review. To listen to all the latest podcasts, please subscribe from your favorite podcast outlet. And to stay connected on and off the show, you can follow us at Hairdistry on Instagram and all other social media platforms. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Peace and love.